If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Luke 1, verse 35. Luke chapter 1, verse 35. In Luke chapter number 1 and verse 35, the angel answered, said to her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. Yes. Father, bless this holy book now. In thy name I pray. Amen. Now that, of course, was in response to the question that Mary posed in verse 34. Then said Mary to the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? That was a natural question. That was not an unbelieving question as Zacharias. But this is a case where this young virgin girl wanted to understand how in the world can this happen, that I shall bring forth a son. And uh, verse number 31, 32, how is this going to happen? And he explained to her how it should happen. Now there are those who in the pulpits today in America and throughout the world that deny the virgin birth. They deny it outright, blatantly, openly, arrogantly, affirm that the virgin birth is a myth and that, uh, that there is no such thing in Scripture as the virgin birth. And you and I both know 700 years before Christ, the uh, prophet Isaiah prophesied in chapter 7 and verse 14, Behold, a virgin shall conceive. And uh, here's the thing. Now you can go back and look at the context of Isaiah 7, 14. You'll see that it was a sign to be given during the lifetime of Ahaz. But it reached far forward and past that and the reason it did is because Matthew, the publican, and also Luke refer back to this event and refer back to this prophecy and refer back to the fact that this is a virgin supernatural birth. Now, I'm not going to dispute Matthew, and I'm not going to dispute Luke. I'm going to take their word for it because this is the application of Scripture. You'll find so many times where a Scripture is prophesied in the Old Testament partially fulfilled in the Old Testament, as the old timers used to say, but not feel full. For example, the Bible says, I, shall, I called my son out of Egypt. Well, when he called his son out of Egypt, he called Israel out of Egypt. They'd been in Egypt 400 years. But you come to the New Testament and, and the evangelist uses that to make a direct reference to the Lord Jesus Christ being called back up out of Egypt when he went down there to be kept safe from the hands of Herod the Great. Herod died, and so the angel informed them and called him out of Egypt. And they quoted that very scripture, I have called my son out of Egypt. So you have a, you have a double application before the scriptures fulfilled. You've got to keep in mind, too, the Bible's a living book. And the Word of God's alive. It's living. And it's quick. That's what the word quick means. So the virgin birth is not a problem with me. The fact of the matter is, if it wasn't a virgin birth, we would have a problem. Because if it wasn't a virgin birth, Christ would be born like everybody else in Romans 5. When you get home this, after, this evening, turn to Romans 5 and you'll see what I'm talking about. Because in Romans 5, death came upon uh, all men because they've been born of the seed of Adam. And, and Adam sinned, and therefore by his sin he passed death upon all. It's called original sin. And original sin is the issue with all of us. Now, the uh, Catholic Church, and I'm, I think the Orthodox Church also teaches that uh, Mary was not born with original sin, and it's called the doctrine of immaculate conception. And the doctrine of immaculate conception teaches that Mary was, was without original sin, and so therefore she was qualified to be the mother of the Lord. And they use the terminology mother of God. Uh, God was not born. The God-man was born. And there is a difference here. And the wording is very important. So the incarnation is what I guess you might say the absolute foundation for everything that we are. If Christ was not born, virgin born, then, uh, then all the rest of it is a myth and has no basis in fact. And if Christ be not risen, then you're still in your sins. You're dead in your sin. Your loved ones are dead. The way the Bible is structured and the way our faith is structured, that every point that is absolutely necessary for us to believe because they all stand or fall together. You can't have four of them without five. You can't have five without six. And all the points that are necessary, 
In other words, you can't believe in the virgin birth and deny the resurrection. What's the point? See, what's the point? So the incarnation in Luke chapter number 1, he told her how it happened. Uh, how does it happen? It happens by the power of the Holy Spirit. The Lord Jesus Christ was begotten by the Holy Spirit. That's how He was begotten. And the actual uh, uh, supernatural workings of it is in the hands of God. But remember this, a lot of people have a hard time understanding how in the world can a spirit cause a, cause a, a physical human being to be impregnated. Well, you've got to remember this. Everything physical came forth from an invisible spirit being. Remember that. Everything. Everything. And, it was, and, and, and everything apart from the man and a few other that God made, He spoke into existence. And so the power of the highest shall overshadow thee, and that holy thing shall be called the Son of God. In Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 6 in reference to this, as I've mentioned to you time and again, but I'd like to refresh your memory tonight. In Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 6, the Scripture says, And again, when He bringeth in the first begotten into the world, He saith, And let all the angels of God worship Him. Now the context is clear. When He bringeth in the first begotten into the world, the Lord Jesus Christ, when He was brought into the world, God said, Let the angels worship Him. They did. Look at 1 Timothy th chapter number 3 and verse number 16. 1 Timothy 3.16 Here's what it says, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Therefore, my rational mind will never be able to dissect the mystery of godliness. The only way to understand the mystery or any mystery is by revelation. God must reveal that mystery. Now look at this. Without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. That's what happened at the virgin birth. Justified in the spirit. Now look at this. Seen of angels. Now the seeing of angels therefore is a witness to His birth, but it's also a testimony to the angels. Because the angels are associated with or, or happen to be around the birth of Christ. Keep in mind, angels are not omniscient. That's a big term we use in theology to refer to God's knowing all things. That's omniscience. Omnipotence is God's almighty power. Omniscience means that God knows all. Nothing else has that. Satan is not omniscient. I'm not omniscient. Angels are not omniscient. Angels, from what we can find in Scripture, observe and react. Unless God tells them beforehand what He's about to do or sends them on a specific mission, as He did Gabriel, they observe and then react. And that's what happens here in the book of Hebrews chapter number 1. They observed the virgin birth and reacted to it either right or wrong. If the reaction was right, they accepted it and believed that Jesus Christ is God manifest in the flesh or rejected it. In the book of Acts chapter number 7 verse 53, the Bible said, Who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. Angels, therefore, were attendant to the giving of the law. Now why would he do that? Galatians 3.19, Wherefore, then serveth the law. It was added because of transgressions, till the seed should come to whom the promise was made, and it was ordained by angels in the hands of a mediator. <coughs> so angels were directly involved in the giving of the law. You suppose God might have been teaching the angels something? when He brought man under the law, that they were observing something. In the book of Matthew chapter number 4 and verse 11, the Bible said, The devil leaveth him, and behold, angels came and ministered unto him. Then in Luke 22 verse 43, And there appeared an angel unto him from heaven, strengthening him. Where? At Gethsemane. The angels are observing the great plan of redemption and salvation. Now are angels part of the plan of redemption and salvation? Absolutely not. For by Himself He purged our sins and sat down at the right hand of the Father. It's important to keep that in mind. Angels are not part of redemption. An angel had no part in you being redeemed. But he certainly was a witness to it. He was a witness to it. In the book of Matthew chapter number 28 and verse number 2, the Bible said, And behold, there was a great earthquake. 
For the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. Isn't that a remarkable thing? He rolled back the stone to let the Lord out, right? No, of course not. He rolled back the stone so they could look in. Why would a stone hold him if a wall couldn't hold him? The Lord Jesus Christ appeared in the midst of the disciples just a few hours later. While they were in the building, he just appeared. He walked right through the wall. And of course, when he left this earth, he visibly, physically ascended into heaven. Therefore, violating the laws or overcoming the laws of gravity, which nobody knew anything about then, but he arose, he ascended by his own righteousness and glory in the presence of God. So the angels witness the resurrection, they witness the crucifixion, they witness redemption. They witness Gethsemane. They witness the giving of the law. And here in the giving of the law, they are intermediaries. Uh, the Bible says in Galatians 3.19, ordained by angels in the hand of a mediator. Now, the mediator was Moses, but the angels transferred. They were their part and parcel of what's going on. You say, well, why could they be part of the giving of the law and not part of the redemption of mankind? Because the law didn't redeem anybody. That's why. The law didn't redeem anybody. You're not redeemed with corruptible things as uh, silver and gold received by the vain tradition of your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. You've got to remember there's only one Redeemer, only one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. So redemption is totally and completely and absolutely in the hands of God, and He's the author of eternal salvation. It originates from Him, is of Him, by Him, through Him, and to Him. Salvation is of the Lord. He owns it completely, lock, stock, and barrel. He doesn't share salvation with anything. God is the author of it. And the Lord Jesus Christ is the captain of our salvation. The word translated captain is archegos. It means the ruler, the, the, the pioneer, the designer, the architect. The one who goes before, opens the way, and designs what it will be like. So he designed your salvation. Isn't that wonderful? The Bible says here that in the book of 1 Peter chapter number 1 and verse 12, Unto whom it was revealed that not unto themselves, but unto us they did minister the things which are now reported unto you by them that have preached the gospel unto you with the Holy Ghost sent down from heaven, which things the angels desire to look into. Angels are curious creatures. Is there anything wrong with being curious? No, there's nothing wrong with being curious. The fact of the matter is, your curiosity may get you to pick up the Bible and start reading it. <laughs> but angels are curious why are they curious? Because they know that that almighty being above them, folks, God Almighty is as far above an angel as he is above you. There's just a little bit of difference. The Bible said when he made man, he made him a little lower than the angels. How much lower? The Bible doesn't define it. But in Hebrews chapter number 2, when He made you, you, are, you have been made a little lower than the angels. And when Christ came for the suffering of death, He was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. So how far is God above them? He's infinitely above them. Why do you say that? Because He is unapproachable, unattainable, unknowable. He dwells within His own essence. And it makes no difference if it's 10,000 trillion miles or 10,000 and 50 trillion miles. He's still above them. And it's not measured by distance. It's measured by essence. It's not how far He is above you. It's who He is above you. The idea is not that you can reach up and, and, and go to where He is. The idea is you become where He is. He raises you up to His level and to His stature. And that's what He has in plan for man. That God will take you from the dunghill, from the dust heap, as a fallen creature, condemned to hell fire, and put you at the King's table, sitting in His palace, able to eat at His table, hear Him, see Him, and comprehend Him. And you have a comprehension of Him now, and I'll show you how it develops in the Bible. 
The Bible said in 1 Corinthians 11.10, For this cause ought women to have power over their head because of the angels. Now this is a present thing. I mean, this was taught Paul talking to the church at Corinth. He said, ladies, watch out. The angels are watching you. Which angels? It doesn't tell you which angels. But it tells you that they are active. There in the Bible, there is definitely, no question about it, some kind of a connection between angels and, 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 and female human beings. There's a connection. What do you mean a connection? Well, they came down to the daughters of men in Genesis 6. The idea apparently is that when God made a man, that man's made in the image of God. All right? And he's the glory of God manifest in the man. But it doesn't say the woman was made in the image of God. The Apostle Paul in 1 Timothy says she was made for the glory of the man. She's a different creature. She's a human being. She's a human being. But she's different. There's a difference there that apparently the angel just cannot leave alone. It's quiet as it can be in here tonight. Let's go read it. I want you to see, when I say something like that, I want you to see it for yourself. 2 Timothy, uh, let's see the first or second Timothy. Let's go to first. Here it is. First Timothy two. Verse twelve. I suffer not a woman to teach nor usurp authority over the man, but to be in silence, for Adam was first formed, then Eve. And Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Notwithstanding, she shall be saved in childbearing, if they continue in faith and charity and holiness with sobriety. All right. Now there's another passage, and I can't think of it right off the top of my head. Somebody help me. Where it says that the woman is for the glory of the man, and the man for the glory of God. Where is that? Titus? Anybody got a... I just read 1 Timothy 2. Adam was first formed, then Eve. Adam was not deceived, but the woman being deceived was in the transgression. Let's see. I don't know. 1 Corinthians? It's maybe 1 Corinthians. 12? Where? 1 Corinthians 11, 7? Yes, thank you. 1 Corinthians chapter number 11. <clears throat> Verse 7. A man indeed ought not to cover his head, for as much as he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. For the man is not of the woman, but the woman of the man. Neither was the man created for the woman, but the woman for the man. For this cause ought the women to have power on her head because of the angels. It's in the context of the angels looking. This one I quoted a minute ago. Thank you. Isn't that strange? How many of you women ready to run me off tonight? Amen. <laughs> you know what it does for you? It ought to open up study for you. It ought to open up a new perspective on the Bible to make you force you to go in there and start looking at what's going on in the Bible. The man is the protector of the woman. If the man fails to protect the woman, he's failed. If a man, if a man fails to provide for his own, he's denied the faith and worse than an infidel. God lays upon a man an enormous responsibility. It's the man's responsibility. Yes, sir. Yes, I think so. I think so. I th oh, absolutely. 
Well, they, after the flood, they combated them. After the flood, they fought the angels. When they went to Hebron, they brought back uh, the evil report. Uh, Caleb and Joshua were the only two that brought back a good report. They brought back uh, two men were, were carrying a, a pole with grapes on it. And the grapes were so big that it took, a, took, took these men to carry them. And it was just one cluster of grapes, yeah. huge. And these two men carried them. And they said, we're like grasshoppers in their sight. Yeah. But God gave them over to their hand because He gave them into their hand. Uh, the idea, let me, let me go back and probably try to help myself out here before I get in bigger trouble, <laughs> deeper. Angels... In, in the resurrection, they do neither marry nor are given in marriage, all right, but are as the angels. In Christ, there is neither what? Okay. You see that? You take on an identity once you are born again by the grace of God that completely transcends, in other words, moves past, over and beyond the physical reality you know in this world. The reason for this physical reality that you know of male and female, husband, wives, so forth and so on, is for the propagation of the species, it's for the, it's for the order of the home, it's for the, it's, for the, it's for the priesthood of the home, which is the man and responsible for that priesthood. It's for the blessing of God to come upon that home. And look what America has done to it. Look what any pagan culture does to it. They turn it upside down. Feminism has completely turned God Almighty's plan upside down and tried to put the woman in front of the man. And of course, when you, when you, when you turn things upside down, you pervert it. All right? So in this world, God has an order. What's the order? Christ is first. He's the head of the man. The man is the head of the woman. Uh, this is the order that God established in the New Testament. Do I have a problem with Christ being my head? Not at all. The fact is I take great comfort in that and Amen. refuge in that because I don't want that responsibility and position. So the idea is that uh, for, whatever, for whatever God has given the man that, that's different from the woman, the angel finds in the woman some kind of an entrance and some kind of a, a there's a drawing power there. For the woman, for the, for, the, for the angel, for the woman. Angels view women entirely different than they do men. Yes, ma'am. I, I tend to, like, just reading this and doing this now, is, are not angels, like, created by God? Yes. Okay. Everything's created. And so, in like manner with man, you know, after God's image, maybe because the angels don't have another entity from them. See, they're from God, man from God, women are from men. So maybe it's that a, a, a jealousy or an attraction to that the, they don't have anything that comes from them. Women come from men. Oh, you're talking about well, yeah, they had the See, they, they had the giants, God, and that was a that was an aberration, a hybrid. Yeah. Uh, I'm going to get into the image right here in a minute. Maybe it'll open up some things for us. I have a, a, another question with that. When uh -huh. you're talking about the power on our heads. Right. Does that mean our husband's power? Does that mean the Holy Spirit? Can that be both? Well, the woman, the Bible said the woman's hair is given to her for a covering. Her hair. And it says in the Bible plainly, it's a shame for a man to have long hair. Yeah. And uh, the only ones in the Bible that had long hair were the Nazarites. And the reason they had that is because it set them aside completely. To, to, obvious. When Samuel walked into town, everybody shuddered. How did they know it was Samuel? He had long gray hair. He was a Nazarite. Well, I don't, you know, that gets into the bobbed hair <laughs> situation. What? <laughs> uh, I know, but I, I, that's a good question. Uh, who? I don't know how to determine what length is improper for a woman. Would you? Uh, I saw a woman today whose head was, her hair was shorter than mine, and I thought that looks that strange. But, but, but she might have had cancer or something, and she might. You know, you've got to be careful about stuff like that. But I think women ought to have hair that is definitely different from a man. I think that's the main thing. Grandpa, different. My grandfather used to say, what short hair, ear bobs, is yeah. some preachers wouldn't have any. I know. <laughs> 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 but but uh, a woman's hairs are glory. 
<laughs> yes, sir. Well, you know, something like that is not all that clear. I know a lot of churches, a lot of the older churches, a lot of Orthodox churches, the women never enter into the church without a scarf over their head. And, uh, I mean, that's just the way it is. And I'm certainly not going to be one to criticize something like that. It's very difficult to, to know the mindset behind that statement about marriage. Yeah, it is. A lot of that is cultural. A lot of cultural things involved in it. What you may be saying here, what you may be trying to say is that if when a woman tries to look like a man, that there's a signal being sent. Is that possible? It's just something I Well, sure it is. I mean, you see lesbians today, you see them everywhere. They, they, they try to look like a man. And, I mean, it's obvious. It's, it's, it's just blatant in your face. And, uh, and I've never known a man yet that it didn't repulse. Uh, you know, and I'm sure the women feel the same way about it. Now, when a woman tries to look like a man, and then, of course, when a man tries to look like a woman, we've got the same thing, too. God, uh, God differentiates the, the gender, and He means for it to stay different. He means for a man to look like a man and a woman to look like a woman. And uh, that fits in whatever culture you belong to. A man looks like a man, a woman looks like a woman. And that's the way it ought to be. Yes, sir. There's a, there is a bond in marriage that God ordains and recognizes. It says the bed is undefiled, but whoremongers and adulterers God will judge. When it comes to marriage, God holds the man accountable, but He also gives him responsibility and authority. And yes, He does. And that authority is a spiritual thing. And when it comes to spiritual in, intrusion or uh, invasion, that man has authority. And uh, he can go against the enemy and protect his family. Uh, I, I firmly believe that a husband is the protector of his home. And if he refuses to protect his home, he has refused, he's, he's refused his manhood and he's refused his responsibility before God. And uh, that's the way it ought to be. That's, that's the way the Bible holds it, very clear. Yes, ma'am. No, that's a that's a classic case there. They, they wanted the men. The angels appeared as men, obviously. That's the first thing. Uh, no angel ever appeared in the Bible in the, in the feminine gender. The only time anything feminine shows up is in the book of Zechariah when they look like storks. And, uh, they, uh, and they're wicked. The Bible said this is wickedness. But other, apart from that, it's always male, male gender. And so when these males, they look like men, appeared in Sodom and Gomorrah, these sodomites, these perverts, all gathered at the door of, uh, of, uh, of Lot, and they wanted to, uh, they wanted to have uh, uh, pervert relations with them. Yes, sir. Absolutely. As it was in the days of Noah, so shall it be in the days of the coming of the Son of Man. As it was in the days of Lot, he said. Obviously, it's obvious that right before the second advent, there will be an invasion of this perversion. And that I've always believed that the reason there is so much of this perversion today, and it's being rammed down the throats of everybody, it's supernatural. It's a spiritual thing. And uh, people are being brainwashed. They're constantly getting this thing, homophobe, homophobe. Okay. Now, here's the way it works. 
uh, in the in the uh, in the psychiatry psychologist uh, what do they call them I forget what their terminology is for their for their organization they have what's called phobias all right the term phobia is an unnatural fear all right hydrophobia uh, arachnophobia for example fear of, 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 of uh, spiders and so forth and so on a phobia is an irrational fear okay all right they pounded that into the minds of the people for 40 50 60 years now they've created a term they're good at creating terms homophobia all right if you oppose sodomy then you are a homophobic and that means you have an irrational fear of sodomites that's what it means so they've classified you demonized you condemned you and they're ready to put you away <coughs> pardon Yeah. Oh, I know. I know. Uh, but I have never in my life seen a country and a culture go to the dogs as fast as I have this one uh, to embrace perversion. I've never seen anything like it in my life. Because I guarantee you, believe me, the world I grew up in when I was 17 years old was nothing like this. You can't get kids today to understand that. It was nothing like this. It was as far different as the culture is today, as the North Pole is, as from hellfire. <laughs> There's no comparison. Well, a little boy kisses a girl on the hand and they, they, they sent him home. They kicked him out of school. Six years old, five years old. Now, if it had been two boys kissing, there wouldn't be any problem. marked him as a sex offender it's insanity folks I mean it's time to wake up it is insanity a little six year old boy kisses the uh, hand of a little of a little girl son ain't nothing wrong with that <laughs> nothing <laughs> yeah what you're, what you're saying about uh, Genesis 6 you know coming again makes it just jumped in my mind 1 Timothy 4 1 talking about this the doctrine of devils, that's the demons, and seducing spirits. Right. And that's what it is. In the Bible, the same, same group have a form of godliness and denying the power thereof. It's a religious crowd. It's a reli but can you imagine what an angel would look like? It'd just be a perfect being. Yeah. Just, uh, yeah. I, I could see how they would be sedu seductive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because they've got power we don't have. And they have a spiritual connection we don't have. It's a different world. It's the kind of world that you better prepare, you better be ready for, because the way the government's headed right now, the government's going to come down against you. The education associations already come down against you. And uh, anytime you have the American Psychological Association, Psychiatric Association, make statements like they're making, that goes right into the medical field. It goes into counseling. It goes into the whole nine yards. It goes into everything. And it goes into the Department of Human Services, the DHS. It goes into your children. It goes into your, uh, your uh, authority over your children. And, and uh, they have redefined everything, folks. They can take your kids away from you for nothing. For nothing. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you see where yeah. Where and if you believe the Bible, if you believe the Bible like we believe the Bible, you're branded a a uh, bigot yeah. and ignorant, and uh, and everything else that goes with it. The man that's in the White House right now is the most uh, hateful, anti-Christ, anti-Christian that's ever been in the White House of the United States. Amen. It's obvious to anybody, anybody. 
that's got half sense can see that. And uh, he is no friend to Christ or a Christian. Yes, sir. Well, uh, this stuff happens in the, uh, most of the time it happens in the, in the background, it's happening, and people don't realize what all is happening until all of a sudden it just all busts loose on them, and they realize that all of the freedoms they think they have and all of the, everything's changed, it's gone, it's over with. And that's exactly where we are today. Uh, it's going to, and, and we are today, not where we're going to be five years from now, where we are today. I'm just waiting for active persecution to start on the government level, the federal government, I'm waiting for active persecution to start, and uh, and uh, and when that day comes, it'll wake up a few more people. And and uh, but uh, I don't know. I'm looking for the Lord to come back. Uh, the only thing you can do is take is take your make your choice. You make your choice. You either choose the Lord in the Bible, or you choose uh, you choose this uh, this uh, pervert generation. And if you do, if you choose the pervert generation, get ready. You're going to be taking the mark. You'll be taking the mark, and the mark is, is here. It's at the door, and it's time. So Christians need to hear it. The emerging church movement, some of the biggest names in the country in so-called Christianity, they are embracing sodomy. How are they doing it? They're saying, well, I'm not so sure it's bad, and I'm not so sure the Bible defines it this way, blah, blah. In other words, put doubt in the minds of the people. Instead of, you heard me tonight. There wasn't any mis mistaking what I said, none whatsoever. No mistaking what I said about sodomy. The Bible's plain in the book of uh, Leviticus, chapter number, uh, I think it was 18, 1 Corinthians 6, 9, 1 Timothy 1, 10, Romans chapter number 1, uh, and a few other places. It's clear. It's as plain as it can be, plain as the nose on your face. Amen. The Bible is clear about sodomy. And uh, so what happens? The Bible is pitted against the pop culture. You just happen to be a member of the pop culture of 2013 in the United States of America. You didn't choose to be here. You didn't choose to be part of what's happening in history at this point in time, but this is where you are. Neither did the people choose to be where they were in Nazi Germany in 1939. <coughs> they didn't choose to be where they were on, on Black, uh, Black Monday, October, whatever, the 21st, 29th, in, in, in 1929. But you just happened to be there, and when you're there, you're there, and you have to make a decision what you're going to do. Amen. I want to go to heaven. I don't go to hell. Fear not him that can kill the body. You better fear him that can destroy both body and soul in hell. So when it comes down to making a decision about your eternal, your eternal destiny, you better know that it's based on the Bible. Amen. I'm not a homophobe. I'm a Bible believer. I refuse their designations identifications, explanations, understandings, and definitions. I don't care what they think. I know what the Bible says. That's what I believe. And I'm at the end of a long list, 2,000 years of Christians that believe the same thing. 
Don't ever let them brainwash you into thinking that you've got a twisted, distorted, perverted mind. 2,000 solid years of Bible believers have believed what we believe about that Bible. Amen. It is this insane, brainwashed, uh, lunatic generation that has turned black to white, white to black, up to down, down to up, called evil good, and so forth and so on. The only way you'll ever keep your sanity is to stay in the book. Amen. Amen. That's plain as I know how to put it. Yes. It's everything. That's right. He's reading from Romans 1, and that's as, uh, as plain as it can be. Uh, let me give you one final thing here t tonight. You know, Fox News has come across as the voice of conservatism and the voice of uh, morality and family values and blah, 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 blah. You had better take that with a ton of salt. Because some of those commentators on Fox News are as pro-sodomite as they can be. Don't for a minute trust Fox News as the voice of God. It is not the voice of God nor CNN, MSNBC, ABC, CBS, and, and NBC, and, 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 uh, and the Gannett News Corporation, and all the rest of the newspaper publishers in the country and the whole world. Do you know what Vladimir Putin just did in Russia? He reached out to the news media, put his hand around them, and said, you're only going to report what I tell you to report. Did you all know that? You sure did. The Russian Orthodox Church over there in Russia is warning their people against the corruption of the Western world. Corruption? Sodomy. It is still against the law in some of those African nations. I think Ghana is one of them. It is against the law to be found a sodomite. In other words, it runs all over the world. So they can t tell you that you're a homophobe all, the, all they want to. You go back and you check and you can look at these ancient civilizations and you're going to find out that they are absolutely opposed to it. And folks, don't ever set foot in an Arab country under Sharia law and be caught as a sodomite. They'll take you out and hang you. Islam is as definitely opposed to it and against it as anybody could possibly be. Yeah. And then I'll give you a broad view of the whole thing, why it's happening this way. The elite, the Luciferian elite who want to destroy the fabric of America, they're going to do it by destroying the home. And this is one of the ways they destroy the home. Another way they destroy the home is to turn the children against their parents in these public indoctrination stations they send them to every day. They're going to turn the children against the parents. They're going to undermine and overthrow the very fabric and foundation of the home. Half the marriages are ending in divorce. In some places, 70 to 80 to 90 percent of all the children born are born out of wedlock. They're filling the country full of children who don't even know who their daddies are. They get out here in the streets and they go in mobs and they just beat people up just for the sake of beating them up. Everything in America is changing. It's an upheaval. Why? Because they know the only way they'll ever rule a nation like America is to destroy the very soul and heart of it, the foundation of it. And where there is no family, there is no basis, no foundation, and destroy their faith in the Bible and God. And they've been working at it for a long time. And they're just about there, just about at that point. They're going to have a one world government. And when things get bad enough, everybody will scream for that one world government. And the Antichrist will step on the stage. And he's already here. Yes, sir. This is not too much of a topic, but when you sort of touched on Sunday, is, uh, is this a, is this, I see a conspiracy that's been since the beginning of time when Satan perceived he 
there's been a great distinction going down to this nation across the world down to the coming of the Antichrist and the Great Distinction. But people in this nation are being deceived right and left and believing, you know, what up to, to certain elite people want you to believe and again, we're away from the truth. Anytime you destroy a person's faith in the Bible, they become easy pickings to deceive. You take a Christian that's rooted and grounded in the Scripture, full of the Holy Ghost, he's hard to deceive. Hard to deceive. But that's not the case. So how do you do that? You undermine the authority of the Bible. How do you do that? Mr. Darwin did his part. Science falsely so-called does its part. And the pressures that come from economics and other places, they do their part to undermine your faith in the Bible. You're going to find out, folks, the Bible's true. They'll find it out. They'll find it out the hard way. Amen. Father, I pray that you'd, uh, that you'd bless what we've done tonight. I pray you'd be with us, Lord, as we meet again, Father, in your house Sunday. I pray, Father, for the presence of the Holy Spirit. God, I pray that you'd give us that grace and strength and courage tonight to stand true to your word, true, Heavenly Father, to the calling, true, Lord, to it, true, in the face of lying and deception, in the face of ignorance, in the face of darkness, that you'll give us the wisdom that we need to stand in the face of that and stand true. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I've got a special request for you tonight. It's my...